Cloud Software, and also uh, an alum, alumnus of UTD, graduated in 2005 or or eight. So uh, he's going to. Hello, everybody. Yeah, there we go. All right, it's Friday. Come on. Give me a little energy. All right, so uh, my title is Producing Borderlands 2. Um, as uh, Leighton kindly mentioned, my name is Matt Charles. I work for Gearbox Software. Uh, my title is Producer, and I graduated from UTD in spring of 2008, not too long ago. In fact, it's very weird for me to be on this side of the stage now, so soon after I was sitting where you are. So. Uh, I'm here, of course, to talk about Borderlands 2 and uh, um, my role on the project and what we did and how we um, you know, went into developing the sequel of, of the hit game Borderlands in 2009. So I wanted to share specific information about our methodology and our processes. Um, what I can't do, unfortunately, sorry, is on an individual basis tell you how best to run your project. Every project is different. However, I can share what worked and didn't work for us so that you can learn those lessons and apply those to anything you do in game development. So first off, what does a producer actually do? And that's a really good question. Nobody seems to know, but I've uh, tried to enumerate it a little bit. Um, the producer's main mission is to make sure that the game ships on time, on budget, as set by business, and to the quality bar um, that the company or the project itself wants. Um, specifically, we're in charge of maintaining the high-level mission, establishing the goals for the team, uh, anticipating any needs that could arise, um, removing any obstacles that get in the way, either real or potential obstacles, uh, tracking progress of the team to make sure we're uh, going to hit our targets, and occasionally being a camp counselor. Um, when we're leading a large team, uh, 140 plus people in the case of Borderlands 2, um, personalities are going to start, well, conflicting with each other from, uh, you know, now and again. So. Uh, you have to be um, in a role where you can be level-headed and uh, smooth things over for the sake of the project and your team. Um, most importantly, though, I think the role of the producer, especially in pre-production, is to ask questions. Um, it's one thing to sort of have an idea, um, but if it's not well thought through, then you're probably destined for failure. So, first off, why were we making Borderlands 2 in the first place? Well, <laughs> Borderlands 1 did pretty well. Thank you guys very much. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, and, of course, we were excited about the future of the Borderlands universe. Um, you know, we felt that we had a lot more still to explore um, in, that, in that IP, in that universe. And when you have the combination of the two, you know, business wants to make the sequel and the team itself wants to make more of the game and explore the universe. That's a really good combination. So our high-level goals for Borderlands 2 starting out were simply a better Borderlands. Um, we knew we didn't do a lot of things uh, quite perfectly in the first game, and we wanted to address those first off. Um, business gave us the mission of uh, this should be approximately, excuse me, a two and a half year development cycle for the game so that we could still come out on, uh, you know, Xbox 360, PlayStation 3, and of course PC. Um, and uh, finally, last but not least, we were still going to be a, a role-playing shooter. You know, um, sorry that Borderlands 2 was not going to be a turn-based strategy or anything <laughs> silly like that. Um, we, we planted that stake in the ground and went from there. So, um, When we first uh, assembled um, the, the team, which admittedly was just sort of the, uh, the founders of the company, um, an executive producer, a senior producer, and myself, um, so it was very production heavy at the very beginning, um, we came up with a mission statement. This is uh, an important piece of language um, that I've taken some excerpts from uh, to share with you uh, that serves as a useful tool throughout development to make sure that we're all sort of abiding by the same guiding principles and we all have the same understanding at a high level so that when those disagreements inevitably come down the line, we can take our positions, apply them to the mission statement and make sure that we're doing what we agreed on. So our mission statements uh, in particular were iterate if possible, innovate where necessary, but always stay true to the proven RPS form of building a foundation for the future of the franchise. Uh, demonstrate a significant measurable improvement in both customer and critical acclaim, and maintain a high performance team that trusts one another in decision making and execution. Now revisiting those points um, in detail, um, stay true to the proving RPS formula. That was an important point. As I joked earlier, we're not a turn-based strategy for the second game. Um, we wanted to explore the gameplay that we um, uh, uh, pioneered um, with, with Borderlands 1. Um, the second point, the most important word here is the word measurable. 
Um, it's also, uh, as I mentioned, you know, a great thing to have these ideas, but unless you can really measure it um, and, and prove that your iterations and your continued work is actually doing something to the quality of the game, um, then it doesn't really mean much because everybody is going to have, you know, especially on a creative team, their own idea of what the game should be and where it should go. Um, so that word in particular was very important. Um, we leveraged uh, what Gearbox calls its truth team. It's basically a usability lab. Um, we do focus testing and user research. Some of you have probably gone on site and played the games before it's released, so you know exactly what I'm talking about. I'll get to uh, more of that in a minute. And lastly, but certainly not least, maintaining the high-performance team that trusts one another in decision-making and execution. We have a lot of uh, creative wizards on our team, and they are fantastic. But if they are not corralled, or if they do not agree on what direction they should be running, it will be chaos. So that is in there specifically to trust each other towards the common goal. We can have a team, but if the team isn't working together, we're going to get nowhere. Speaking of the team, don't underestimate the power of the right people in the right positions. Um, specifically, we took uh, a few veterans of the Borderlands franchise, uh, Steve Jones, our technical director, who's, who's been with Borderlands since the inception of the project. Um, and obviously, he resumed his role for the second game. He's um, sort of guiding uh, the code team and uh, exerts a lot of influence on you know, what is possible and what isn't possible. So we aren't spending our time because a designer thinks maybe an RTS would be fun. He can say, no, that would be uh, a waste of all of our time, and we shouldn't do that. Um, our lead structure is also very important. We knew that we were making a big game over a long period of time, so um, it's important to have people in place that can manage effectively and lead um, uh, you know, their, their respective department teams uh, to success or towards the common goal. And finally, this is um, something I noticed and, well, and um, feel pretty strongly about. Play to people's strengths um, when you're determining roles, not their weaknesses. Um, if you think of people as D&D character sheets, right? If you have a player that has a lot of 18s naturally right out the gate, but he has you know, an eight in wisdom or something, well, you actually still want that guy on your, on your team. You want him in your party. Um, if, you, if you organize that guy based around his weakness, well, that's great. You may have your bases covered, but you're actually not going to get anywhere. Um, versus playing to their strengths, you will get somewhere. You can organize people around um, the momentum that they will create internally, and you can sort of corral and direct that towards the common goal. So one of the first things we did as well was to undertake a critical, what we called a critical review analysis. Um, this was very data-driven. We parsed through all of the uh, reviews with scores that were given to the first game. This is a massive, massive undertaking. I really cannot uh, overstate that. Um, it took three people quite a few months um, to do this in, in conjunction with our inter internal post-mortem as well. You can kind of see it on the chart there, but essentially what we did is per publication, um, and even, you know, we kept track of region, uh, what the overall score was, but on the side there, on the columns, we kept track of um, you know, what did, what did that particular review talk about? Did they talk about co-op? Okay, yes. Did they say something positive, neutral, or negative? And for each one of those categories, we generally assigned, um, you know, an up, an even, or a down arrow to the side. So you can kind of see on the, the gradient there of color how a lot of people um, talked very positively about co-op, which is the second uh, last column to the right. Everybody was really happy about co-op in, in Borderlands 1, as it turns out. At least the reviews were. Um, so that's something we felt but couldn't quantify until we did this. Um, this was very useful because, of course, it gave us insight into um, you know, what was really working in the game and what wasn't, judged objectively, not just by our own personal feelings. And, of course, the output of this is to absorb all the information and then quickly make decisions about what we want to tackle and what we want to explore in Borderlands 2. Two particular uh, examples I've called out here excuse me, are uh, vehicles and PvP arenas. Now, you might uh, initially suspect that what we did, well, is, okay, leave everything that's green the same, um, cut everything that's, you know, neutral, and approve everything that's red, or, or even cut that too. Well, n not quite, um, because we have to consider, you know, where our passion are and where we want to take the game versus, um, you know, what is uh, reasonable to do. Um, in this particular case, we got a lot of complaints about the vehicle handling in the first game. Uh, most of them were from me, but other people also said bad things. <laughs> so um, 
uh, our, our decision there was actually, you know, when considering vehicles, absolutely we could have cut them. We could have cut them um, from Borderlands 2, but we chose not to. We felt that that actually did relate to the core promise of what it meant to play a Borderlands game. So our decision there, despite um, the state that they were in, was to go ahead and spend effort and prove them. On the other hand, um, we had these PvP arenas uh, that were present in the first game. And uh, the reviewers and sort of the comments we got either were neutral, didn't mention them, or kind of disliked them but weren't really sure. Um, and that, that would have been an easy area for us to you know, bring up and have some competitive multiplayer ladder as well. But our decision there was actually to cut them from Borderlands 2 because we felt that you know, it's really not a core promise of what the game is about or what we want the sequel to be. So to-do lists uh, are not very effective until you put them on a calendar. Once you put a to-do list on a calendar, then it becomes magically effective for some reason. Um, so that's a large part of my job as well, is to make a high-level schedule. Um, you know, once we've determined what sort of areas we want to um, focus on, uh, we need to map it out and just at a very rough level plan out what's going to be possible. So um, getting ahead of myself a little bit, but you can see from the graph that we knew we wanted to have uh, approximately three acts in the game. And by acts, I really mean sort of the, the missions tied into the, the levels that you're going to. So how we first start, once we've uh, gathered consensus on what to do, is we break down our, our high-level schedule and missions into attainable short-term goals. It's cool to say, hey, I want this done in a year, but unless somebody knows what they're doing today or next week, it's probably not going to get done. Anybody who's had a research paper due in a couple of months knows exactly what I'm talking about. Um, so our process, just having the process and the framework was extremely important. Um, we did take a lot of time making sure uh, that, that the process we implemented was uh, correct for the team at any given stage. Um, when I say process and framework, that's not generally something you um, set in stone once you have a meeting about and say, this is how it's going to be for the next two and a half years. It's something you actually need to periodically evaluate as your team size changes, as the mood of the team changes, as your goals change, as you get closer to release. However, in the beginning, um, one critical thing we did was to establish a ratification process. So again, when we have a lot of um, high-powered creative individuals on the team, um, you know, everybody has a lot of ideas and a lot of passion, maybe their own pet uh, features that, that, that they want to see for the, the sequel that we you know, ruthlessly didn't implement or cut from the first game. Um, but those ideas usually involve more than just one person to make. So, we uh, latched onto the idea pretty quickly of establishing this ratification process early on. Uh, and what this ratification process was, um, was consensus building um, between the leads or the effective stakeholders of each department. So for example, um, we wanted, uh, an, early, uh, an early complaint we had was that, you know what, when you go into the downstate, um, it really kind of sucks. I, you know, a bullet hit me or a grenade hit me and now I'm stuck behind this barrel and the enemy's over there and I, well, I guess I'll just bleed out. Well, that's not fun. So how we addressed that is we had this design that said, well, okay, let's, let's fix that. Let's make it so you can at least move while you're in that you know, fight for your life state. Now that seems pretty straightforward and that was pretty agreeable to everybody on the team, but we still needed that to go to, through the ratification process because it touches more than just design, having the idea. It touches animation, it touches audio, it touches code to make the thing. So in that case, we needed uh, those four departments to give their go, you know, stamp of approval on that idea. Um, this makes sure that when it comes time to actually work on the thing, everybody already has that sense of investment and knows why it's being done. It's not something that somebody just thought up in the bathroom one day before coming to work. So. Additionally, the, probably the most important point here is the ratification process itself requires consensus building. So any problems with the design are aired and worked out sooner. For example, going back to the uh, fight for your life state, um, something that um, uh, was uh, recognized pretty quickly was that it could be unbalanced to be able to move and shoot in the downstate all at the same time. Um, that was actually a concern that was brought up and the design was immediately changed and then it was ratified. If we had prototyped it, then made the design change based on the feedback, that would have been more costly than making the decision while it's still on paper. So really the lesson there is, if you're going to have a design that affects lots of people, make sure they're all bought off on the design and have the opportunity to change or affect or give feedback on it before they are required to do work. <clears throat> um, 
As for the tool itself, we use a program called Confluence. It's made by uh, Atlassian. It's very similar to um, sort of your standard wiki uh, markup. Um, basically, it's just the idea that uh, passing around doc files and Excel files really kind of sucks. Um, so let's have it be a web page that everybody can edit and mark up. Um, I suppose it could be substituted with Wiki, but um, we just chose Confluence because we use another Atlassian project, uh, product as well. Um, oh, yeah, something else we did was usability of uh, the software was very important as well. So the first thing we did was make it look like Microsoft Word. So instead of the margins being you know, as, as wide, um, for example, as the screen is here, we made it so that the margins are more streamlined and more looking like a, an actual piece of paper because that's how designers were used to working. That's how they were used to writing. So that let the designers feel comfortable with this new technology to actually use it so that others could take advantage of it. Um, the other Atlassian project I'm, uh, pro blah, product I'm talking about is Jira. And this is our uh, task tracking database. So again, um, especially in a project as massive or as long as this one, um, we need to identify discrete tasks or even high level tasks that need to get done. And um, they can't all just live in our own heads. Otherwise, stuff is going to get lost really fast. So we make the distinction between a design document space and an actual workspace. This is so that a discussion or a suggestion doesn't get confused with an action item. So. And last but not least, perforce, it's source control. Um, it really sucks when you're iterating on an idea and you get to revision number three and you learn that, man, revision number one really was the best. And if you've saved over everything and you can't do anything about that, that's a giant waste of time. So that's the theory, <laughs> the quick and dirty behind uh, source control. We just happen to use Perforce. We nearly lost our data history during uh, Borderlands 2. We had a bit of an IT event where uh, one of our servers decided to catch on fire. So that was scary. <laughs> I was actually the most scared I think I've been at work, um, but also the most relieving at the same time, because, well, if it's all gone, cool, new project. Uh, so. <laughs> so, that was that. We had a good run. Yeah. And briefly, before I get into the, the real meat of things, our production stages. Um, various uh, people on the production track will ask me, so for Borderlands 2, you know, when did we leave what's called pre-production, and when did we enter full production? And it's not a thing that happens overnight. It's actually a gradient. Um, Pre-production is usually defined by um, having ideas and then going out and making sure that you can answer questions that you still have about that idea. Production generally represents the stage where you've answered most of the critical questions, and it's simply a matter of executing on um, the work that remains. Um, yeah, funny story about uh, iteration loops as well while we're, while we're on the topic. Um, so we, we had, uh, has, has anybody, I should have really asked this from the start. Has anybody played Borderlands 2 yet? Oh, you guys. <laughs> Thank you, awesome. Um, I didn't ask whether you liked it, so maybe I shouldn't do that. Um, <laughs> uh, so uh, anybody played Zero, the assassin? OK, awesome. That's like the same amount of people. I guess everybody's playing Zero. Um, that, that's cool. Uh, he didn't always have his deception ability. In fact, what it used to be, um, was his uh, dash melee attack, which is now one of um, his sub uh, tr uh, skills in the tree. It used to sort of be the other way around. Um, by default, his action skill was sort of, you know, a charge melee attack. And we determined that um, uh, we were coming up to a point in the schedule where it had just been implemented. And we knew, we identified that iterating on that action skill to the point where it was going to be able to, we're, we're going to be able to adjust all of the other skills that relate to it, um, et cetera, and, and just really just make the skill fun by itself. We wouldn't have time for the number of iteration loops we thought we need because we said, well, each time we evaluate this thing, it causes these sorts of changes in you know, effects or audio or animation. And so this design was actually very, very costly to iterate. So we changed it. We changed it to deception. We still kept the work we had done in the dash melee attack, and we ended up with an action skill that was easier to iterate on and allowed it ultimately to be higher quality than if we had kept with the original decision. So specifically talking about establishing goals, anticipating needs, and tracking progress here for a minute. Part of my job is to establish milestone goals. So this is one of my um, sort of tracking spreadsheets, and as you can see, we had quite a lot of goals at that point. Uh, that was kind of a lot to keep up with. <laughs> uh, 
Um, additionally, this is uh, a screenshot, uh, I cap or rather a capture I took of um, an Excel chart I kept that tracked generally how we were doing. Um, in JIRA, we have tasks and bugs. Bugs are predominantly entered by QA, looking at our game and going, hey, something's broken. Um, tasks, on the other hand, usually represent uh, a piece of design that is yet to be done for the game. So it's developers creating work for other developers versus QA creating work for developers. Um, the red line here, sort of on top all the way, is the average creation rate. So we had, I mean, it's just supply versus demand at a certain point. Because if we have more things coming in than things we're actually resolving and, and completing and putting into the game, well, we have a problem. We have to decide, uh, you know, what do we need to not do? Um, and this was taken, uh, let me see, I thought it was about December of 2011. So we weren't quite done with the game yet. And that red line is shooting up. That's when we um, sort of had the publisher QA start. So on average, for example, that high point is 69.3 uh, created issues coming into our database per day. By contrast, over that same time period, we we're only um, resolving 52.9 of those issues per day. So in that time period, we were still having a deficit of 17 approximately issues coming in per day. Now, I'm not going to get into the weight of those things. Some things are easier, like a typo. You know, that's easy to fix versus this entire character is broken. Well, that could be harder to fix. Um, so it's not quite an accurate, uh, a super accurate measurement there. Um, but here's the really interesting thing. This is the new graph now with more time on it. And you can see the scale difference between the two is huge. Um, this 557.6 number up at the top, that's when our, uh, that's when our supply finally met demand. And that was a very happy uh, period for me because it meant that we were resolving bugs at a much higher rate than they were coming in. That was awesome. We could really see uh, the quality of the game increase um, almost by orders of magnitude during that period. So that was kind of cool. It, it's good to have these numbers, I think, uh, just to back up feelings that you'll have during the course of game development so you can understand, you know, why do I think the game sucks on any given day? Well, it's because we have a lot of bugs. Or versus, why do I think the game's really awesome this week? Oh, because we fixed all the bugs. You know. Seems simple, but um, a lot of people actually don't do this. And then it's just this period of having feelings and it's emotional roller coaster, and they don't really understand why. So this is actually really important. So starting with our uh, design and story groups, um, we sort of laid down the law that we wanted to have a good story. This was something that came up repeatedly in our critical review analysis. Um, but gameplay must always win. We set that stake in the ground because we didn't want um, to have Borderlands 2 turn into the sort of story-driven, cinematic-driven game where you set your controller down for a while. No, we actually always wanted you to have your hands on the controller. The only exceptions being the intro movie and um, the outro credits, essentially. Though even then, you can still press a button to skip it, so I guess that doesn't count. Um, so, for example, we don't have any non-interactive cutscenes in the game. We have loading screens, but that's just kind of a, um, that, that's less of a game design decision, more of a, a code requirement based on our engine and how we structure the game. Um, and design is really the reason why we have that aforementioned framework in place in the first place. You know, we wouldn't bother with a ratification process if we allowed anybody on the team to uh, drive the game in the same way we wanted the creative director to. Instead, we wanted to support the design directors um, and make sure that they essentially had the power to do their jobs, for lack of a better phrase. Um, yeah. Oh, and uh, to proximity matters. Um, I say this because given our, um, our goal to have a good story but gameplay wins, we really wanted to marry the two. Uh, so my creative or not creative solution of that was to lock the creative director and the writer in the same small room for about a year and a half. <laughs> They're really good friends now, so it worked. But the thing is, had it not worked, let's say they, they get in on um, week one and they hate each other, that's awesome. I'm so much happier that I learned that on week one than on month five if they had been sitting apart and they'd have this, for example, like a passive aggressive feud going back and forth. So I'd rather find that out now. So fortunately it worked out and everybody's happy, but uh, um, either way, I think it was the correct decision because it's really important. As for character development, um, it only took about four weeks for us to get a, um, a decent design decision on our cast. And this was made with um, both the design and uh, the art groups in particular. Um, we started with silhouettes. We started with rough sketches. 
Um, we set down a couple of design rules, a few design rules, easy to learn but challenging to master. There should be no wrong class to play. All should be able to play well, uh, whether you're playing solo or whether you're playing in a group. Um, we wanted the action skills to work with the core FPS loop. And we also wanted to bring um, new promises, but we wanted to give a sense of the familiar promises from the first game as well. So, of course, um, Zero bears some resemblance to Mordecai. Maya bears some resemblance to Lilith. There's extensions of the old characters, um, but they're not clones. As for level design and development, um, we went through this process of pr pretty standard, really, of gray boxing um, and art trickles in and combat passes happen. Um, it was very important uh, for us to well, uh, as well to uh, have the artists in the LD group um, be really tight with each other. Uh, if they weren't, then you get the bad example of, you know, an art team goes off and makes something that doesn't fit in the room, like could literally not fit, not just aesthetically, but wouldn't be to spec or would cause massive clipping issues or whatever. So um, fortunately, everybody was on the same page. We knew we wanted to bring new environments as well. So we started off, uh, we started people off, uh, of course, in, a, in an icy tundra glacial area transitioning to the desert and the grasslands that people sort of got a taste of in the first game. And then finally, volcanoes, because volcanoes are flipping cool. And that was really the thought behind that, so. <laughs> uh, my other point here is about LD is really um, where everything does come together. Um, they have to integrate all the art. They're usually responsible for all the scripted sequences in their levels. They really have their hands um, in just about everything that you see in the game. Um, they're not the last to touch the game. That's usually audio, localization, or uh, programming. Um, but they are sort of where the rubber meets the road. As for the, uh, the art department itself, oh, and you'll see in these past two pictures, it was also really important for us um, and for our culture uh, to, to put things on the walls. Um, we didn't want necessarily a, a sterile environment. We wanted something that was fun. We, we had, uh, as you can hopefully see in that, that shot there, we have our skill trees from Maya. And then we gave everybody nearby on these boards post-it notes. So that, for a while, was our method of feedback. If you thought something sucked, you'd write it on a post-it note, leave it there. The art director would walk by and be like, hmm, maybe he's right. So <laughs> very informal, but very loose. It made people feel um, comfortable with everything we were doing. We wanted to have a sense that it was, it's OK to show your work. Um, we wanted rapid feedback. We wanted um, the sense that we're always critiquing each other, and that's really just for the sake of making a good product, not for tearing anybody down. So the art style did actually stay the same. Um, as you may know, Borderlands 1, that was not entirely true. We changed it at the last minute, or the last second, really. Uh, so that was another stake in the ground. It's like, OK, guys, no art style change for realsies this time. Um, <laughs> that was another stake in the ground from production. Um, and the guiding principles you know, of the art style remain consistent. It should look like concept art. It should be fun. It shouldn't be surgical. It should be loose. So everything in the game is not, not cell shaded. It's hand painted. So consider the amount of time that that actually takes to do. And uh, give an artist, a Gearbox artist a hug if you ever see them, because, oh my god, <laughs> must have broken wrists by now. Oh, and we also made, a, of course, an art style guide because we had, um, we had some new blood and we, we work with external partners as well or outsourcing uh, studios. And so it's important for us to establish up front before they do any work exactly what we're looking for. So our art director early on took actually a couple of weeks but made this very comprehensive 28-page uh, um, art style guide that details here's how to draw like Borderlands. And creature development. This was kind of the fun uh, process to watch. Uh, the first thing we did, because we brought uh, new systems and new lots of other things into the game, uh, the very first creature we made with our, our new backend or our new code in Borderlands 2 was the Skag. Now that's a little bit surprising because Skags were everywhere in the first game, right? So you think we would have a million to pull from. Well, you're exactly right, we did, but that was the point. We said, well, given the other variables, let's start with um, something we already know how to make and know what's fun. So that at least if it isn't fun, we know it's probably not the Skag, it's probably something else we did. And that proved to be pretty successful. Once we were happy with that and everything we had done, we were able to introduce a lot more creatures very quickly into the environment. But um, <laughs> it was kind of funny. On our vertical slice, uh, our publisher loaded it up. And it's like, well, this is pretty, but 
and, and I know you guys have changed everything, but this looks like Borderlands 1. Like, yes, that's the point. So, <laughs> so the trick was, how can we find the fun and remake the gameplay of the first game um, as a starting point in Borderlands 2 very quickly so we could go from there? Without the baseline, we would have just been making changes in the dark. And of course, we made the, uh, the Stalker. He was unique because um, he was our first shielded creature, and he was all, all, also our first invisible enemy. He was fun. Um, you can see the picture of the loader here as well. Um, we have like 30 or so loader variants, so we went a bit crazy with, um, with robots, but that's kind of cool. Um, speaking of the new tools that we were able to utilize to make the game, uh, we, we really doubled down on this feature, uh, sorry, this new um, dev environment, uh, which we called Construct. Um, as you can see here, uh, this, to make this skag with uh, a light bulb on his head would have been hours and hours of work in the first game because none of it is visual. It was all data driven. You're essentially looking at glorified text boxes um, to try to plug everything in and then you have to launch the game just to see what you've done. And it wasn't very WYSIWYG. Um, but this uh, dev environment enabled us to very quickly establish when we make a change, what is it going to look like? How is it going to behave? And that uh, let us develop so many more creatures than we ever could have without it. Um, additionally, the nice thing, when I say we rewrote things, we, we did from the tools and development side, but at the core, we were still using really the, the Borderlands 1 engine. We kept the, the post process, we kept a lot of the framework because it had already passed certification with Microsoft and Sony, and we knew it was generally stable. So it would have been very silly for us to have thrown that out the window. Also very important was carrying over our debugging tools. We have actually a massive game with millions and millions of guns and uh, creatures, uh, creature numbers in the triple digits. We need to be able to test everything pretty quickly. So keeping our debugging tools intact was also extremely important for making sure that our iteration loops didn't take so long that we wouldn't have time for any. Um, finally, a couple of our challenges that I wanted to, to talk about. Uh, release date uncertainty can be absolutely killer. Um, when, when I'm given the task to, to make sure that the game releases on time, and I don't know what on time is, everything, uh, <laughs> every, everything is out the window. Um, uh, that, that can be very difficult from a, from a production seat, and that, that affects everybody, not just the producers. If you don't know how much time you're going to be able to have to do something, um, then it can be you know, chaos. It's very anxiety-inducing. Um, so lock down your release date, know your constraints, and then you're able to make smart decisions around the constraints. Uh, consensus building can actually be difficult. Um, this is kind of why I talked about earlier being a, being a camp counselor, because um, not everybody's going to see eye to eye. Um, but this is also why I followed that immediately up with ask questions, because if there's usually a, a disagreement, it's based on a misunderstanding. And if you can figure out what um, people aren't saying, you can get them to say the things they need to say. So. Additionally, planning for QA can be difficult as well because we, we kind of have this rule and the publisher, of course, who's responsible for putting the game on shelves and giving it to Microsoft and Sony and saying, will this pass tests? Can we put this on your platforms? Um, they must know that it's been through test cases. They must know that it's been a quality product. You know, we, every game, especially nowadays, has a few bugs, probably more than a few. <laughs> I'm underselling it. But uh, no game probably uh, has the behavior where you put the disc in and then the Xbox explodes. <laughs> That'd be a pretty critical bug you couldn't ship with. Um, so it's important to say that, you know, as a general rule, you can't ship, you can't release what you can't test. So um, that, that can be difficult. That, that's, uh, that is where an experienced QA lead uh, can really help you understand when you say, I have this feature, and he'll ask you, for example, great, what do you want it to do? And he's almost like a producer in that way because he asks so many questions. He's eventually given, he, he's written down while you've been talking, uh, a list of 50 to 100 test cases, things to do, things to try to do to break what you've told him um, you're intending the game to do. So allowing for that time and figuring out how long that can take uh, can be tricky, but it's definitely worth it. Um, because if you, if you don't do that, that's how I think games get rushed and games get shipped uh, very buggy. And um, it's a lot harder to patch a game than it is to make it before it starts getting printed on millions of discs. So that's important. 
And with that, I think I've given you um, quite a, uh, a broad swath of topics to, to talk about. So I wanted to open it up for, for Q&A, because I think um, it's impossible for me to predict every question that you guys have. So yes. How I, how I tried to manage that, the question was, um, did we have any personality conflicts between people on the project? Um, how I managed that was really by, by going back to the mission statement and helping people understand it's not about ego, it's not about personality. What are we trying to do here? As it turns out, we actually are paying people to do a job, so I need them to do a job, not just have a behavioral fit or something. So <laughs> once you sort of help people you know, get grounded and they realize we can move, move past it and they can have conversations. Um, additionally, we kept a shake weight in the meeting room, so if anything got too heated, we would just use the shake weight, which looks ridiculous, by the way. So, <laughs> so it was a great icebreaker. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. The the, the comment just for everybody, if, if you didn't hear, was um, about introducing new blood and how that that can um, help sort of avoid tunnel vision on a on a project or in a group. Um, I, I'd agree with that. Um, over the stage, over the course of developing Borderlands 2, uh, you know, our team size went from you know four at the very first day of producers to um, over 100, 130, not including QA, um, and then back down to about 30 or so as the game enters certification. So we are going to have that challenge naturally as a result of the game cycle, and. Um, I, th I, th I think I'd agree with that, yeah. It forced people to consider, like, I'm in a, I'm in a role where I have to teach somebody new what to do and, you know, what our mission is, and, and that helps uh, people be mature. Yes? Um, well, with the Necromancer coming out soon, how do you decide what is going to give uh, people the chance in a um, um, that's that's a great question. Um, it was how do we determine you know what's going to be a good addition to the game um, in this particular case the, the Micromancer or a player class. Uh, the truth is it's there, there's a little bit of risk. We have good ideas um, from our design team. They they know the game inside and out, um, so they can tell you even with spreadsheets like you know this guy will do that much damage, but we'll probably lose against this sort of enemy combination. They're very math heavy like that, so they can think about new ways. Um, to play the game and new equations to sort of mix up the gameplay. But having said that, that doesn't automatically mean that anything's going to be fun. Fun is a combination of, sure, it could start there, but it's all about player feedback, responsiveness, um, player choice. I wish there was a, a unified fun equation, because I'd be stealing that. But, <laughs> but I don't think there is at the moment. So, so there's some risk. And, and I, I think we, we um, mitigate that risk and help things get to fun faster by uh, enabling rapid iteration. Gina. Um, in terms of like the production schedule and the team, the asset list and stuff, I feel like there's a point in, in production around the alpha beta where it scales up so quickly and things are being iterated really fast. So how do you maintain and keep track of all those iterations without slowing down that, that rapid change in that speed? That's a really good question. So, so uh, your observation was that during the alpha to, to beta period, um, things can ramp up incredibly quickly, and there's a lot to keep track of, and there's probably a lot of iterations uh, flying as well. So, so how do you manage that? Is that correct? Mm -hmm. um, lots of luck, as it turns out. Uh, um, I, I was lucky in that I had a very, um, very capable, very professional uh, group of associate producers who were generally assigned one per department. So we had an art producer, uh, we had a level design associate producer, et cetera, in conjunction with the, the department directors. Um, so once they were able to sort of receive tasks from any other input or from any other department, um, they were able to manage all that and make sure things kept moving through the pipe. Um, I uh, Primarily, that, that really helped me in my seat because I was able to oversee that and just look for global essentially blockages in the pipeline and make sure that, okay, things are moving through in the right priority. We don't need to be you know, retexturing the grass 50 times if we have a character to build. You know, I've got to watch out for that sort of thing. But yeah, that, that can be, I think that was one of the most stressful times of the project simply because there was so much going on. Go ahead. Um, I was wondering what your company plan was, and I'm not trying to, I just mm -hmm. realized that this might be a little bit of a joke, but what's your doomsday plan for um, when one department has 
hit some sort of a technical issue and just literally it is not working and you, you do not know what the, the, the solution to it is, like when an apartment breaks down on some sort of feature and uh, it's just, it's literally not working, like what's the plan to get around that? Is it changing the feature or is it throwing more people at it or what's the, uh, the response to that? So, so essentially what's the, what's the plan or what happens when um, something gets to a certain department and there's a blockage or a breakage or it can't continue past that point for a technical reason or any other reason. Um, so I mentioned the, the stalker creature earlier. We actually had a situation where um, the, I, I, it wasn't modeled in a way, and I mean, uh, this is not a comment on the artist at all. It just simply wasn't modeled in a way that was conducive to how animation had the vision for how it would move. So that meant that animation was given a creature that really could not be animated. We could not get the thing in game because it didn't have the right geometry to move in a certain way, um, like the designers wanted it. So in that case, it actually had to go back all the way up the chain to design to give some new direction and help push that direction down through to the artist. And um, excuse me, that's that's where um, uh, we had everybody working a bit more closely together to make sure it didn't happen again the second time. So. Too long answer, a short answer is uh, it depends on the exact situation. Yes? How do you deal with um, really high level design disagreements? Like when you have um, either like on code and art, we have like this big dis disagreement, um, especially when it's like approaching deadlines. Highlander style duels. <laughs> no. <laughs> No, I, th I, think, uh, I think a serious philosophical um, debate has to happen. I mean, it's, it's, it's lovely when we get to the point that we can even identify that there's a philosophical di uh, difference um, between two people. Let's say they're, they're peers in the organization as well. Um, part, of, part of the big problem, though, is when there's a disagreement, identifying whether it's a, a disagreement about a minor thing or whether it actually reflects a, a bigger philosophical disagreement, which are admittedly harder to resolve. Um, that's the point at which sort of escalation and um, arbitration does uh, sometimes happen. So in a particular case, um, you know, let's say the, uh, the art director and the animation director disagree about something. Well, we try to build um, some level of consensus between the two, but if we can't, maybe uh, the creative director has to weigh in and sort of essentially vote on the direction. Now, it's important that um, not, not everything's a vote, um, not everything's uh, dictatorial demand. It, it really does depend on um, the situation. Um, but in either case, I think you have to be careful as well because um, if you handle it the wrong way, people, especially the person that's, let's say, losing the vote, um, can feel very sore about that. Um, and that's a very real and very fair reaction if it's handled poorly. Um, so when that happens, you have to, to handle it very, very sensitively. So... Great questions. Um, I'll start with, I'll start in reverse order. How we control feature creep is really only allowing features to be considered um, for our backlog of things to do at certain times in the schedule. So for example, um, at the time of a new milestone, or you know, at the end of the other one, it's the, really the same thing. Um, this prevents us from setting our goals, and then two weeks into a milestone, deciding, you know what, this goal sucks, I want to go do something else. He's like, actually, no, we've all committed to at least finishing what we're working on. If there's a technical hurdle that comes up, that's fine, work through it. We can change what you're working on um, in, a, in a couple of weeks. Um, but we've, we've already agreed that it's important to finish it and to take this bet that uh, work is going to be done in this area at least for four weeks. So we've essentially committed to that. And that doesn't always work out. Sometimes there are technical hurdles that make us reconsider a design or, or scrap something altogether. Um, but that's part of the reasons why the milestones are so short, is we can react to it um, without losing a lot of time. Now, I think you asked another question as well, and I'm sorry, I've forgotten it. <laughs> Thank you. 
Mm -hmm. um, the, the easiest uh, answer to give is about um, memory. It's about RAM. Uh, we know that the consoles have a certain amount of physical memory on board, which means we can only do so many things in any given level. Um, we structure our game um, by map, you know, with, with actual maps as opposed to a, some sort of seamless uh, streaming um, technology, which means that when you load into an area, you now have everything that could possibly happen in that area loaded into memory which means that an area cannot probably have 200 missions by itself. It can only contain a subset. It can only have um, a certain amount of creatures. It can only have a certain amount of, um, blah, certain amount of animations. Um, so that's, uh, that's, that's a constraint that helps us consider, well, okay, what should we do in this area? What should we do in that area? And from there, it's a balance of um, what is going to come online first. Now, Specifically, you may have noticed that we started with Act 2 up here in the, the high-level blockout and production plan. Um, this was very purposeful because we didn't want to have um, too many variables, too many new variables introduced to the sequel at the same time. Uh, Act 2 is most similarly looking to what we had in Borderlands 1. So we felt that that was a natural place to start so we can test out all the, blah, all the other features of the game that were brand new in um, sort of that baseline environment. Now, of course, Act 2 isn't simply a copy-paste of anything in the first game, but we didn't have to answer questions like, how saturated should the grass be? You know, it, it's weird. Actually, at that detail level, it can make a difference. So it, it's a constant juggle, based uh, especially on you know, um, what creatures are ready, uh, what plans we have for the creatures, how risky they are as a result, um, who can work on what things at a time. Um, it's, it's, I, I'm hard pressed to, to sum it up as a theory other than simply just asking a lot of questions, seeing what's possible, and then trying to maximize the return based on uh, who's available to work on any given goal you have. Um, I would give, get, get everything being equal though, I, sorry, I will add on to that though, um, that I tended to resolve ties, so to speak. If it looks like we could have made the loader or we could have made the stalker and everything else was equal, I say, well, what do we suspect is going to be most valuable uh, to gameplay or to the the user playing the game. That was almost always the deciding factor. So I felt that was fair. So yes, in the back. Um, let's see. Depends on the department. I actually don't have any associate producers who are generalists. Um, each one is specialized uh, for a given department. Um, so I want somebody who understands the, the missions of a producer. Um, who um, ha has a good background in the department that they're managing and also has a sense of awareness of, let's say, it's a, a, let's say it's an art producer position. Well, artwork tends to be handed off to either level design or animation teams, um, generally speaking. It's one of the two. So uh, if that producer has an understanding of what the animation team needs, that's, that's going to work pretty well. Um, versus let's say that associate producer doesn't have a good understanding of what level designers actually do with all this pretty art that we're making. Well, that may not be a great fit because now we can't ensure that communication is happening between the level design team and the art team. Also, long walks on the beach. So, <laughs> yes. Um, so we uh, wanted it to feel, it, it was kind of a, a loose um, guideline for us in the sense that we wanted it to feel like, yes, you were still on the planet of Pandora. At the same time, there was a lot more of this planet that people haven't seen. So it was really about making sure the environment and everything in it and really the, the places you'd go felt consistent with what you had seen before, or at least believable with things you had seen before. So does that answer your question, more or less? All right. <laughs> Um, it's a good question. Avoiding burnout. Um, in, in the case of the artists, we, we try to make sure that, um, uh, well, we rely a lot on self-reporting and self-identification. Um, one of our uh, 
kind of pillars for for the team is transparency and honesty. You know, if you if you if you're an artist and you, you know what you're just really sick of doing Hyperion assets, you just hate the color yellow by this point. <laughs> tell somebody for God's sakes, <laughs> and we'll and we'll try to do something about that. Um, in that particular case, we'd probably move them on to uh, another suitable task, or perhaps that's a convenient time to take a vacation. Or, you know, there's a variety of options once you get to that point that you can do, um, because very rarely is there nothing left on the priority list to do. Usually, you know, like, well, you know, we have a backlog, so if the thing you're working on, um, you know, you, you just really can't do, or you have to, you know, uh, create a block and can't make progress on, you know, and, and it can um, not be in the milestone, for example. That's, that's fine, we can trade it out with something else or deal with it on a case-by-case -case basis. Any question? Yes? Uh, giving these talks, because they're really scary. <laughs> it's, it's uh, I think it's not getting too complacent. Um, basically, I, don't know how many programmers we have in the audience, but my, my days should really consist of uh, running several um, while statements in my head. Uh, while team is running, okay, do nothing. <laughs> if, if, if danger of team not running, do something. You know? uh, so I'm constantly sort of evaluating what could go wrong, or actually not even in that order. Is something going wrong? In which case, do something about it. Uh, then could something go wrong? In which case, try to avoid it. And um, yeah, that's pretty much it. It's kind of sad that I can sum up my job in two if statements, but yeah. <laughs> but but that that can be very draining because um, that's that asking yourself that is a routine. It's something that you get um, in the habit of doing, and habits are awesome until you get bored of habits. You know, not consciously, but even subconsciously, you're thinking, well, it, it's easy to get um, sidetracked on you know making a pretty chart or something, and then oh shit, the team's on fire. I should probably deal with that. <laughs> So, yeah, that, 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 can be, uh, that can be, I guess, the most, most challenging part. I really don't mind the, the personality conflicts or whatever. Um, I don't mind uh, creative disagreements. It's, it's, uh, it comes with the territory. So it's really just making sure that um, I'm, I'm trying to imagine what the best producer in the world would do and then trying to do that thing. Yes? Uh, I don't have a problem with it. Um, no, um, I, actually, no. People are, uh, tend to bathe. We haven't put, we haven't had to put, you know, no shirt, no shoes, no paycheck in the in the contract or anything yet. Um, it, no, it's been all right. People, people who manage to get themselves to work have generally already taken care of that. So, <laughs> now having said that, I also try to avoid crunch periods because I've never mandated, I never mandated any crunch period for Borderlands Two. Because that is a great way to get sleeping bags showing up in the office, and I don't want that. So, yeah. Yes. Um, one of the things that you said uh, previously in the slides is that to uh, maintain the, uh, I, guess, I want to say, integrity of the game, like, like for instance, you want it for a to be, you were demanding that it's going to be an RPS. Mm -hmm. I'm fortunate enough to have never had that problem. <laughs> so, sorry, I can't really uh, answer that question out of experience, but um, it, it's not really come up. And I think that's something that would really either uh, the game gets signed or it doesn't. At the point where any money is agreed to change hands, you've established that already. So that's that's something that either it, it's it's settled on on day zero, really. So, yes. Now we'd have to figure out what is the what was the intent. Excuse me. What was the intent of um, features that could perhaps be com conflicting with each other? And um, uh, we'd probably start with the question of well, are there changes we can make, s subtle or s um, small tweaks to 
uh, to those features we could make to make them work harmoniously. Um, if not, then the question is, well, if it's an either or situation, what is uh, most valuable to the customer? What is most valuable to the player? So at that point, once, once, you know, if all things are equal and they're both done in game and it does turn into a situation where something's got to go, it just can't live at all, um, then that's really how we make the decision. What's the most valuable? It's not about time or effort spent. You know, we could have spent two years on something, but if the thing we took a week on is more fun and um, just serves the game better, ultimately, compared to including the other one, well, that's the one that lives. Follow up? <laughs> Yeah. Um, I, had, I was thinking about, uh, yeah, how you were saying before that the development for the game is uh, on average usually two and a half years. Uh, what do you think about uh, over your ideas or thoughts about the you know adding the adding the new uh, technology, new hardware into you know the latest, latest consoles and things, and how that affects you, you know, your company. What do you think? Um, that's an interesting question. I think Gearbox in particular, um, you know, our, our highest level mission is to entertain the world. That's actually what we want to do. We want to make people laugh and be entertained and have fun. Um, and we choose to do that through the media of games. Um, I think we'll continue to do that regardless of what hardware or what platforms continue to come out. Um, we'll make sure, of course, that using our own judgment that we can make games that will be entertaining on whatever new hardware comes out. And then it's a matter of just, you know, where, where do we focus our time? We choose to focus, of course, on PC, uh, PS3, and 360 at the moment because that's where we believe we can um, you know, r reach the, the biggest audience. We also happen to be huge fans of those platforms ourselves, so it kind of helps. We're kind of biased. Um, but you know, we're not focusing, for example, on the 3DS. There's, not, uh, there's anything wrong with it. It's just we aren't really experienced or motivated to go explore that field. So. But we're very glad other people do. I love mine. So. Yes? Yeah. Uh, so the question was, you know, how did we um, get the music in Borderlands 2? How did we decide that, and what was the process there? Um, uh, we happened to have, I guess, drawn some attention with uh, the Cage the Elephant in the first game. So that really helped us um, contact some people who, and by people I mean um, record labels, who said, hey, they just did that really cool thing over there. Let's talk to those guys. So um, it was possible then to get the license for the Nero song, uh, Doomsday, uh, for the trailer. Um, we went searching for, um, you know, what would be the, the best music to include um, that really hit the tone of the game as well, and that's how we found the heavy. Um, so they were, they were really cool about it. So we're happy to do that sort of selection. As for the score, that's, that's um, sort of handled internally in-house. We, um, we contract out to uh, Jesper Kid, for example, and he does some really amazing work for us. But, um, yeah, that's how we get the licensed music. Yes, in the back. So why did we stick with um, one action skill per character? Uh, essentially, we, th we thought that was one of the core um, variables that we really shouldn't change for the sequel. Um, we thought that was one of the defining elements that actually made Borderlands 1 fun. It's that, um, <laughs> we sometimes call it the fun button. You should be able to hit this button and fun happens. So, <laughs> so uh, we didn't want to mess with that. So, yes. Um, it looked uh, it looked pretty similar to the first game, though um, we started out with our Act Two uh, components, which was um, the grasslands, 
Uh, so <laughs> I got to have this great phone call with the publisher where he says, you're not going to believe it. We found a new color. We like to call it green. <laughs> You've never seen it before. Because <laughs> there really wasn't much in, in Borderlands 1. Um, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, did you want to follow up? I know that was a crappy answer, so <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> Um, so, so our vertical slice, which happened um, roughly June of uh, 2010, um, we, we concentrated on a couple of things. It was important. For, so, for example, we showed uh, uh, Marcus, uh, the NPC, walking around and throwing darts. And uh, th this particular map didn't make it into the final game because it was really more a proof of direction and proof of technical ability than saying, we've built this thing that's going to ship. Um, so we had, for example, Marcus walking around near a house in the grasslands and speaking new audio and uh, gesturing, which was, uh, you know, kind of a new extension for NPCs um, for us. It, it sounds so very minor when I, when I say it like that, but it does have, a, a, I think, a, a large effect on um, the actual gameplay and how you think about, I'm in this living, breathing world versus, well, that guy's just standing there waiting for me to come up and talk to him. You know, he's actually doing something. And that was one of the areas we wanted to explore. Um, additionally, uh, we had... Um, in that same level to show off uh, things we were focusing on and had done so far. Uh, we had new vehicle, uh, excuse, not the new vehicles, but the new vehicle uh, handling. So for example, you could take the runner from the first game, put it in Borderlands 2, and it wouldn't get stuck on a pebble, and that was huge for us. So I don't know if anybody remembers how uh, finicky the control was in the first game. So um, it, it was sort of things like that. We had uh, Skags jumping off of other rocks to get to the player and things. You know, we, we had doubled down on the AI already. Um, so if you had just started playing Borderlands 1 and were very familiar with it, and you played the um, vertical slice map, you know, just a few months later, those differences really stand out to you. So those were the sorts of things we, we focused on. So, yes? So game design can obviously be very different. That's a, that's a really good question. Sorry, I'm trying to think back um, to my game design classes and not offend Monica. <laughs> no. um, I think I, th I think perhaps it's not clear in the game design um, elements, or or perhaps I was a very poor student at the time. But um, just how much you have to consider other departments and other people and the, the rest of the team that you're working with, especially the QA team. Because you may have an idea that's great on paper, but if it's buggy as heck and game companies are businesses, right? We do actually have to ship games, as it turns out, unless you're Valve or Blizzard. But <laughs> hey, they're, they're awesome. They can keep doing what they, what they want to do, and they're, they're very good at it. But um, um, for, the, for the rest of us, um, we, ha we do generally have to ship games in a reasonable time frame. So if you try to design something that just cannot simply fit into any s reasonable schedule, you're going to have to reconsider and reevaluate your own design. And I don't know, um, no, admittedly, I haven't sat in a game design class recently, but I don't know to what extent that is being sort of reinforced. So the message there is kind of be flexible, be adaptive. Don't just have one plan. Actually, be prepared to have many. <sighs> All right. <laughs> yes. Um, so Borderlands 1, I feel like I didn't really end set itself up for a second one. Mm -hmm. And I think it was kind of a surprise hit uh, for a lot of people or for y'all at least. At what point did y'all say, and I'm sure publishers on the other left, but at what point did you say, yes, we're going to make a second one, yes, we'll keep making these, and at what point do you say, I think this one's kind of enough? So that's an interesting question, because I was um, also a producer on the DLCs for the first game as well. Um, so I worked closely with the internal team for uh, the first three that came out. And we actually um, used a, 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 an outsourcing partner to do the majority of the effort on the fourth one, the Claptrap's uh, revolution. Um, it was about at the end of the third one, General Knox, which was by far our favorite to make because we had a lot of fun with it. Um, and it was, turns out it received very well. So I'm now having this correlation that the happier the team is, maybe that results in good products. But uh, So I've been giving them candy every day for the past two years. Um, 
That, that's, that, that was when that decision happened. Um, we felt that working on downloadable content was awesome because we got to experiment and explore and try new things in a very um, sort of bite-sized way. Because you know, five to, to ten hours of, of content for a much lower price than a, a full game, of course, and we had the framework to build off of. But when we start thinking of, um, excuse me, ideas that we really want to experiment with, or when we feel like we really want to tell a longer story, or you know, do something crazy like add another vehicle or add new playable characters, that's when that momentum builds to say, well, we're we're really happy extending the life of the, the first game, but the stuff we want to do, the stories we want to tell, simply won't fit into that structure. So let's go ahead and commit to, uh, to the sequel. Now business, of course, does have a lot to do with that. If the first game had sold you know, three copies, we wouldn't be having this conversation. <laughs> so, yes? So uh, I'll restate the question just to make sure I understood. How do we keep everybody on the same page in terms of uh, art, I guess, both from a technical level and aesthetic point of view? Is that correct? OK. Um, that's, that's where our art director plays a huge role. Um, his, he's really chiefly tasked with uh, the responsibility of making sure everything is cohesive. You know, Everything, essentially, looks like Borderlands. And that can mean, yes, I believe that that asset was made by Hyperion, because that's what a Hyperion ship would look like. Or, um, you know, yes, uh, that definitely looked like it came out of a skag's mouth or something like that. Um, that that's really his task. Uh, we have uh, a variety of people, though it is also, in our particular case, the, the art director's responsibility, because he's awesome at everything, uh, for determining technical specs. So saying, um, you know, this asset needs to be uh, 500 verts versus that asset needs to be 20 verts and needs to use a 256 versus a 1024 texture. You know, so the, um, it, it's, it's a balance there. Um, we tend to uh, move quickly but carefully. Um, so in the case where we've made this asset, we put it in the level, and it turns out that we've blown our memory budget, well, we need to figure out what can be reduced to make everything fit. So. You and you. Start with you. Um, with the style of Borderlands 2, you know, sort of the, the comedic humor that goes up throughout the, the game and in itself, and you have the class trap and the, the dub set and the trailer. <laughs> how, do you, uh, how do you define the creative sense of this style over the course of the lifespan of the production of the game? Because uh, I think a lot of that might be inversion. How much of just like moving around the office creates the style of that game? Uh, more than you'd think. <laughs> so we start, if we start with the, the, you know, the high-level story and the things that we want to do in the game, in particular, our uh, plot mission is kind of anchored, but then tweaked over the course of de development as we determine, hey, what's possible, what isn't possible? Can Handsome Jack destroy a planet? No, we probably can't do that, so all right, rewrite that start part of the story, you know, that sort of crazy thing. Um, but the side missions, on the other hand, are uh, where we like to experiment, and um, those are relatively easy compared to the plot structure, which, man, touches the entire game if you're to change one point in the narrative. Side missions are kind of, um, or it can be one-offs. So if we want to have some fun there, that's where uh, somebody can get a crazy idea to have like the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, although not for legal reasons, um, <laughs> as a side mission and do that in a week. And that turns out to be awesome. So yeah, yeah. So, so, yeah it's, it's pretty flexible. Yeah. Yes? That's actually what I was thinking of when I gave that answer. Yep. Um so so that sort of game balance I think is um is high on the list of, of things we're looking at. We're responding to feedback there. It's difficult for us to really tune that sort of system when we're at a point where we know we're going to have DLC. Um, we don't know quite what that DLC is yet, but yet um, we know that we have some areas that may need tuning and balance. Um, and meanwhile, like in between, the game is already asserted or already printed and about to be released. So um, of course, the game released um, you know, a few weeks ago. And we have, um, we have preliminary data on, OK, it looks like people may want something else to do with Iridium. 
So maybe we address that in the DLC. Um, I think that's pretty high up there. So we should be finding out soon, actually. So yeah, that's, but you're correct, and that, that's the sort of thing we do look at. Well, uh, thank you very much, Matt. Cool.